This week's episode of Better Call Saul was titled Breaking Bad, a callback to the first Breaking Bad episode featuring Saul, being named Better Call Saul. This felt like a pretty appropriate scene to introduce Walt and Jesse, with it being the genesis of the partnership. I liked how there was a good balance of plot-relevant elements to these scenes, whilst also featuring some fun moments, like Jesse asking about Lalo. This scene out in the desert was the source for many Better Call Saul plotlines, so for this to be the scene where the trio were revisited felt suitable. The intro for this week's episode was pretty interesting. The way the tape is set up, it appears we're fully into the endgame as it were, with a new recording recording occurring, and a flash of the crossroads that we see later in the episode, a sign that we're now in the part of the show where things are uncertain, and anything could truly happen. We're beyond that prequel era now. We're beyond Jimmy and Saul, we're taping the new character of Gene, and we're not quite sure who he is yet. The main focus of this week's episode was quite literally Breaking Bad, as we see two groups of criminal partners step up their game with the help of Saul and Jean, with the end of the episode heavily suggesting that we're seeing two instances when Saul made a destructive life choice by entering into a partnership. The Mike P.I. scene in Saul's office in particular was interesting, giving us a completely new perspective on Saul's involvement with Walt and Jesse, showing he was very much a driving force, much like he is now with Jeff and Buddy. Saul is the only one putting any means of belief in Walt and Jesse in this scene, and in many ways it suggests him to be the reason they went as far as they did. They were amateurs until Saul took them pro. This is contrasted to Gene's current situation with Jeff and Buddy, two amateurs also, but amateurs without much potential I would argue. I imagine this was somewhat the meaning behind the new perspective on Breaking Bad that the writers had suggested before the release of season 6. This idea that, sure, Saul wasn't the mastermind behind it all, but his connections allowed the mastermind that was Walt to truly come to fruition, and have a fighting chance in the messed up world he had forced himself into. I really like that personally. It keeps Walt still as this formidable character, yet shows the importance of Saul in that relationship, which is further interesting, given how much Walt often talked down to Saul and saw little worth in him. In the Gene timeline, Gene is almost role-playing a mini Saul, setting up scams, talking on his earpiece, wearing his ring. We see that he's almost trying to replicate the effect he had with Walt and Jesse, which is why I think he gets so angry when Buddy refuses to scam the cancer guy. He's trying to re-record those Breaking Bad days. He knows deep down that these two new guys aren't capable of what Walt and Jesse were, but there's still this fairly pathetic attempt to recreate it presumably out of pain, from a certain conversation. Speaking of, the main turning point of this episode comes in the form of the scheduled phone call that we were hinted toward in 405 quite a ride. There's a catch-up conversation where we hear a recounting of the aftermath of Walt's death and Saul and Jesse's disappearance. We get a bunch of name drops and we check in with Francesca, who essentially confesses that everything is pretty awful, and all things Saul have been seized and are gone, including his offshore accounts. At the end of the conversation, Francesca says she received a call from Kim, and his name came up. It's this weird jarring moment when we hear her name, and Jean almost has a similar reaction. It feels strange to hear that name in the Gene timeline, and when Francesca confesses that she called, it's clear that even Francesca, who currently has only hate for Gene, is actually kind of sympathetic toward him. Gene then gets ready to leave, and we see those crossroads. What those reminded me of was the whole bad choice road statement. I hate bringing this statement up, because I feel it's overused as a metaphor, and placed onto too many situations but I think this one is fairly intentional. The idea that there's a good road and a bad road, and once you're on it, you can't get off. We have this dirty road, and this cleaner, clearer road, and they actually intersect. To me, this says that there's still time for change, even at this point. There's still time to walk that good road, and in fact, the good and the bad intersect. It isn't one or the other. We've been affixed to this idea that once you're on the road, you're not coming off but we've never really questioned how true that is. A particularly notable thing, what with Kim being the living proof of the possibility of a full-on life change. I suppose we'll have to catch up with her first to confirm this though. After all, the Bad Choice Road line came from Mike, a character who has most definitely set himself down a path he has no intent on deviating from. Jean then returns to the phone booth to talk to Kim. It seems like he calls her work, 
which is a place called Palm Coast Sprinklers in Florida. This is a fairly unceremonious sounding job. It reminds me of that conversation she has with Schweikert and his partners way back in season 2, when she went for a job interview there, and confesses that if she hadn't become a lawyer and moved to Albuquerque, she would be a cashier down at the Hinky Dinky. It seems she may have returned to a similar image when moving to Florida, the alternative to this being married to the guy who ran the gas station, so possibly a hint that she's also married now. Or remarried, I suppose. She's clearly avoided being a lawyer, but equally hasn't tried to alter her identity, still going by Kim Wexler. It feels like this is almost set up as Kim's own Cinnabon in Omaha, her own time away, alone, with a mundane sounding life. I kind of like the idea that in reality she's doing the opposite to how we see Jean. That's really just a complete shot in the dark though. We know Kim can kind of hack a fairly boring life, and can actually repress her desire to con people. It's the exact same state we see her in, in season 1 of the show. We unfortunately don't get to hear the conversation, but we do see Jean destroy the phone booth, the smashing of glass being almost this symbolic moment of him slumping back into his Breaking Bad days. A potential visual parallel with the breaking of meth glass. Maybe a bit of a push. <laughs> The takeaway from this conversation, based on the fact that we don't know what's said, it's safe to say that Kim rejected Jean in some fashion. She denounced him once more, or simply reinforced her original statement from when they broke up, that they're poisoned together. This ultimately seems to cause Jean to slip back into Saul, or his need for Saul, the one thing that could protect him from that emotional rejection and ultimately the fact that no one is around to love him anymore. He just has Saul, the creation that arose from all of his failed relationships, all of which contributed to it. Jean's life in its current state, up to the phone call, felt very similar to Walt's back in Breaking Bad, 515, Granite State. Where Walt had Ed as his last line of connection to the outside world, Jean has Francesca. Walt attempts to contact the ones he loves, only to be met with rejection, Jean doing the same. Then having the characters both slip back into their old ways post their escape for one last bang. The only difference being currently that Jeans feels more like a fizzle, with his lower level scams and cons, compared to Walt's Felina. It could be fairly interesting if Jeans' ultimate fate is that he's brought down in an unceremonious way, after relapsing back into his scamming ways. We'll have to see. It would make a lot of sense if Marion took him down. The show has always had a big focus on his relationship with elders. Jean then restarts his partnership with Jeff and Buddy, Marion watching with a closer eye, by the day. Both Jeff and Buddy are also getting more reluctant, and almost fearful of Jean, and his desire to scam. The scam appears to be some kind of identity theft, stealing people's financial information, to be sold on to whoever's willing to buy. We know this isn't happening for money either, with Francesca reminding the audience about Saul's diamonds being plenty. This is purely to forget again, to embrace Saul once more, like he did to forget Kim, Chuck, Howard, and the rest of it. The first guy that gets scammed this episode reminded me a lot of Marco, mainly by his size, his suit, and his general vibe, particularly in the way he kept placing bets with Jean. He seems like the kind of guy that Slip and Jimmy would have gotten along with. The difference being that we're now on the other side of that. No longer are him and Marco wolves, now he's a wolf to the wolves, making sheep of those around him to distract his tortured mind. I think that was also meant to be a bit of a reality check almost. It's reminding us of those small time days with Marco, getting a few thousand dollars from a fake watch. They were fun, and they had a good time. But they were never particularly malicious, nor profitable, and they were usually done on people who seemed to kind of deserve it. Gene doesn't even look happy throughout this thing. This whole thing is also below Gene, with his likely millions stashed away, and tens of thousands more he's making from his new credit card scams. It's this really sinister look at how far we've come from Jimmy to Jean. This Marco guy just having a bit of fun seems innocent to the standard of Jean, and his elaborate scheme of picking out single and rich targets and stealing from them. It makes him seem almost creepy, with him playing all of these people so perfectly. With this Marco guy in particular, I imagine he's seen each of the different little tricks he pulls on him a million times over, but he clearly plays it down just to get the scam done. The scam itself is also really dark and quite creepy, not just in the way Gene manipulates people with such ease, but the surrounding events of it too. They pick a target, get them drunk, 
drug them, break into their home, and steal all their information. That's really sinister and quite creepy, honestly. It's this really dark moment, which is only put to a stop when Buddy discovers that one of the guys they're scamming has cancer. It really puts Jimmy in a new light. It feels horrible to see him this way. It's very similar to Walt's constant slip back into the meth business, despite his many chances to get out. It's this repeat hope that there could be hope for our protagonist. It's been a lot harder to accept this dark side of Jimmy, I think, comparatively to Walt, because Jimmy feels far more humanized and beaten down by the world. He was always the underdog, and his actions have always seemed far more justified and a product of how others have treated him. Where he is now, there's really no excuse to be given. In part, I think it's a Walt parallel with this cancer guy, but I think it's also just to show how low Gene is going here, literally scamming cancer patients, possibly one of the worst things he's done. At the end of the episode, we get a very shocking cut between the moment Saul walks up to the guy with cancer's house and Walt's school. We can probably go on the presumption that it's drawing a parallel to each of these situations, ending in disaster. This event leads to destruction. It's made further despicable as Gene smashes the glass to enter the house. It's this far more hands-on approach that paints Gene in a slightly blunter way. He's often been the guy who has a guy, an arm's length away from the true violence of the crimes he was involved in. Now he's the one physically punching his way into this house. Despite the smaller scale of the crimes, there's something that seems so much more criminal about him now. Maybe that's just me. My question now really is, how does this end? Each episode we see, my mind completely changes on how I think this could end. My own little theory has been that each episode from 9 onward has almost been a suitable ending week by week. Fun and Games was the reaching soul conclusion to the series. Nippy was Jimmy Lives in the Eternal Gene Prison episode, leaving Saul behind. I'm curious therefore how the final two will play out. Based on that transitional shot to Jimmy lying in the grave dug by Walt and Jesse, it seems like it wants to pretty heavily suggest that death is coming his way, or the events of Breaking Bad have already dug his grave. His fate is set there is no redemption. A self-destructive spiral that results in his capture seems pretty likely from here. 